I have glimpsed eons and borne witness to horrors that mire the mind. So let's go ahead and talk about it. Hey everybody, welcome back to another video. Today we are going to be talking about Man After Man by Dougal Dixon. You guys really seem to enjoy the speculative biology books, and this one was recommended to me. Let's go ahead and jump on into it. So the first one that we are going to be looking at today are the Aquamorphs. They were genetically engineered to be frog-like so that they could go down into the oceans and acquire new minerals for the people at the surface so that they could build rockets to escape what is currently a dying earth. They look sad, but it's just resting frog face. They're all right. Nine out of ten, not my thing, but a frog friend. A friend is a frog enjoyer and would be mad if I did not rate them higher. Next, we have the vacuum morphs. They are designed to withstand vacuums, but are unable to live in gravity. They are highly pressurized from the inside so that they can still maintain their spherical shape. They have got four lungs inside of them, two of what would be pretty standard set, a third one to hold extra oxygen while they're out in complete vacuums. Uh, they come back inside to recharge it, and they've got a fourth lung that holds carbon dioxide as waste, just in case they need to breathe it out or expel it so that they can return back to the ship if they ever lose contact with it. 7 out of 10. They gave wonders to the world that they themselves would never enjoy. And now we have the high tech. They are machine people. They have a myriad of genetic disorders with them brought about because of modern medicine was able to treat the genetic diseases. So the genetic diseases just kept getting passed down until just about all of them have them. They move from... They are put into their cradles immediately after birth and have all the relevant artificial organs they would need. The iron lung, the iron kidney, the iron liver, even the iron heart. 3 out of 10. They are sheltered and they are very judgmental. They do not like the creatures that they have created. Which are... The Plains Dweller. He lives across savanna-like environments. He's got fingernails that kind of wrap around their relevant fingers to create a grass scythe that helps him cut off tough grasses. He has a ruminating gut that allows him to eat the grasses without really too much, uh, too much worse for wear as the cellulose is able to be brought, broken down in them. 5 out of 10, they're reclaiming the lost world. These are the forest dwellers. Anarcho-primitivism wins. It is time to return to monkey. They have a very stable environment. They also have a ruminating gut used for leaves and other such things. 7 out of 10, sylvan life seems like a nice life. These are the tundra dwellers. Polar bears are out. It is time for the polar apes. They are migratory as they try and... Stay within a comfortable temperature range as it gets warmer in the summers. They will migrate south as it gets colder in the... No, wait. Scratch that. Reverse it. As it gets warmer, they will migrate north. As it gets colder, they migrate south. They have ice pick toes to reach sweet grassy greens underneath the ice. Four out of ten. I don't like the snow. It's cold and irritating. And it melts everywhere. The Woodland Dwellers. They have a generalist playstyle. They don't really need to work for food. They are able to eat grass, leaves, insects, small mammals, whatever you can think of. A lot of the high tech thought that they might be the most human after all, as they are most like the ancestors of humanity beforehand. 7 out of 10, they're kind of like the forest dwellers, but they're in a more temperament environment, not tropical. These are the tick. These are... They replaced their mechanical suits with artificial biological ones. How many limbs some people have is a fashion statement. Just what? Uh, two out of ten, they're Cronenberg monsters. They've got viscera as skin. They're very bad. I don't like them. We're moving on. Addressing the state of the world. Earth is pulling a less dramatic krypton. The magnetic, field, the magnetic fields of Earth are slowly shifting to a point where they are basically non-existent for a lot of people, which interferes with tick technology, as well as some 
navigating instincts within a lot of creatures. The Dweller Folk ten tend to not interact with each other, but they do start making contact, but don't really recognize each other as similar species. The world is healing, but it is growing much colder. The Tick are running low on renewable energy as the changing climate uh, interferes with a lot of wind power and solar power they had built up, and a lot of the underwater renewable energy that they've been gathering from waves is starting to break down and it's not being fixed, so they slowly run out of food and energy to continue on. Next we have the Aquatics. They have been here a while. They were a last-ditch effort of the humans that were leaving to create a fully aquatic descendant. But they just don't do much. They're, they're swimmers, and I don't like them. They've got a very hauntingly human face. They don't really change much, and we'll revisit them here in a little bit. Three out of ten. They are SpongeBob's Nightmare Incarnate. These are the memory people. They have descended from the woodland dwellers, and during the time of an approaching ice age, they started to unlock the ability to have a genetic memory of their ancestors about different places that would hold good food and that would be able to sustain them. But I'm calling hacks. That's just not fair. Six out of ten. Cheaters. These are the symbionts. Now, they are descended from both the woodland and tundra dwellers. They started interacting more and more. The tundra dwellers were non-aggressive to them, and the woodland dwellers started being able to work with that. So, the carrier is the tundra dweller. He generally carries the hunter everywhere they go, so that the hunter doesn't have to waste explosive energy on continuous use. Uh, the hunter will go out and find different meats or creatures that they can hunt, and it is a very good symbiotic relationship. In the first appearance that they had in the book, they took out a massive squad of lemmings, which I found hilarious. Today I learned Tundra Dwellers give immaculate hugs. 10 out of 10, the power of friendship. These are the hibernators. Please forgive me. They, they didn't have any art assets, so we're just going to pretend for a while. Now, the males hibernate through winters. The females migrate during uh, when they have to give birth. The males have a lifespan about four to five times longer than the females because they are able to conserve energy and other such bodily wear and tear. The males, when they are waking up from their hibernation, build fortresses so that they can help guide their mate of the last few years back to home. Sometimes they get lost, sometimes they find a new fortress, but it generally works. Five out of ten, we need to find a way to balance out that age difference. These are the cave dwellers. They have a very funny Latin name, and I appreciate it very much. They, uh, they kind of just left. They, they found some cool caves that they liked a lot and said, Man, we got, we got shrimp down there, we got water. I mean, we got, we got everything we really need. We don't... We don't have to go outside anymore. Good for us. They took Plato very seriously and embraced the cave. Five out of ten. These are the water seekers. As the changing temperatures started to affect them, they started encountering the plain seekers, which would hunt them, or they would encounter the tundra, which they were not built to survive. A great many of them died out. The only ones that were able to survive were ones that had an innate instinct to find hidden water in the deserts. These are the islanders, the small ones, not the big one. They were isolated on an island with very little food and over a few millennia got smaller to use less food and became near obligate carnivores. The things that they are about to do to that very tall tundra dweller was one of the worst parts of the book. Three out of ten, they are feral chihuahua people and I do not like them. The socials. They are descendants of the plain dwellers and live in desert environments. They scour the deserts looking for roots and other such uh, underground food sources. They have a friend, the water seekers of before. They have adopted them into their society as a symbiotic relationship where 
the socials will hunt, and all the water seeker needs to do is find them water. If a pack of socials does not have a water seeker, or just wants a whole lot more of them, they will find another pack that does have a water seeker, and will wage war against them over who gets to keep their friend. Um, yeah, pretty good. 8 out of 10. Teamwork makes the dream work. These are the boat people. They remembered how to use fire and metallurgy and craftsmanship and immediately deemed it illegal. All the people that actually did want to use such technology to build boats or other such devices were hunted down because the memory people of before kind of realized that, man, our ancestors really dropped the ball on this one. Maybe we shouldn't follow in their footsteps. 9 out of 10, the human mind is returning stronger than ever. Now that now we have a superpower that allows us to access historic memories. Update Aquatic. They overpopulated the ocean and lost a lot of their food sources like krill and shrimp. Now they have to travel onto the land to find it. They developed this weird ability to make a spherical gel that holds water in so that they can traverse on land. In a couple million years, the whole food shortage thing is done with. They just grew a lot of algae on, like, river plains and other things. 2 out of 10, the aquatic people really haven't made any sort of impact. Yet. Now we have the update at 2 million years for the artless ones. These are all the ones that I could not find any art on, so we're just going to all throw them in together here. The travelers have almost completely un unlocked all the genetic knowledge of their ancestors, but refused to use it on principle. They generally tried to dissuade planters, descendants of the hibernators, and plains dwellers from unlocking and rediscovering such knowledge, such as agriculture and other such things. Cave dwellers, they ate a couple travelers, and then they went the way of the dodo. They really were never mentioned again and are not around in the next million year update we have. The planters, they are descendants of the hibernators. They wake up, plant some seeds, do some house maintenance, and then they go back to sleep for a year while the seeds that they have planted grow. These are the hivers. Uh, they are descendants of the socials and seekers. They have a strict societal structure where you are either, either a gatherer, a nurse, a warrior, or you are the queen. Oh, isn't that nice? It's holding a baby. No, it's not. That's the, what the seekers have become. Since the socials take care of all of their hunting, food, needs, they are only useful for being able to sense out water. Their architecture is actually really cool. Since they still live in the desert, they have this evaporator that helps cool off the local environment inside the architecture. Um, five out of ten. If I give you this score, please, please, book, don't show me any more pictures of the brood mother. Deal? Can we agree on this? Thank you. Now we have the host and the parasite. You can't really have one without the other. The host is a descendant of tundra dwellers who ventured south, and they lost their fur. The parasite are the descendants of the islanders. Instead of being feral chihuahua people that attacked and brutally murderized their prey, instead they found a way to keep their prey alive while they fed off of them, and the way they did that was to become parasites. One out of ten, I'm getting Enigma of Amagara Fault vibes, and I couldn't sleep the first time I read that. These are the Fish Eaters. They are specialized forest dweller descendants. They have a very sleek and otter-like coat so that they can go in and out of the water and still be very fast while traveling it. They have archerfish-like brain that can account for the difference between air and water light refraction as they hunt for fish. 6 out of 10. I like otters. Good inspiration. These are the tree dwellers. They are descendants of the forest dwellers that had a lot of their needs easily met around them, and they had no competition or hunters. So, we got sloths back, baby. Or as David Attenborough might say, the sloth. 10 out of 10. Sloths are cool. Now we have the ant, ant men. Convergent evolution means those ants are getting removed from the census. They have similar adaptations to uh, anteaters and other such creatures that 
are able to hunt on large populations of very tiny insects. All the ants that they eat have turned their meat bad as they slowly start incorporating the uh, biological defense of formic acid from the ants into the actual meat themselves as they have built an immunity to it. So a lot of uh, predators that they are around don't like to eat them. Six out of tens, their hands remind me of like an eye eye's hands. And that is just, that's a, that's a long finger, my guy. Now we have the desert runners. Their ears are designed to radiate heat like fennec foxes and elephants do. They also have camel-like humps behind their shoulders that will hold uh, fat and water as backup for when they need to travel. They tend to stick around different hivers so that they are easily able to eat a lot of the bugs that try and infest into the water supply that the hivers have that keep them cool. They don't have any competition with food, so they don't have any beef with each other. 7 out of 10. They remind me of a kangaroo rat, and those are just cool. Now we have the Slothmen. These are descendants of the tree dwellers. With no competition and no predators, they are able to grow into this massive unit before you, and the megafauna have returned. They have very similar traits to Megatherium, the giant ground sloth of old. They are bulky and slow, but they are still dangerous. You do not want this to sit on you. 10 out of 10. Megafauna are awesome. I love them. Now we have the spike tooth. Now the saber-toothed animals are making a comeback too. This is a great time for Earth. Where there is prey, predators will find them. They have started to adapt themselves to be able to hunt the host uh, and the slothmen. They are larger and slower than a lot of other predator animals, but their prey is the slothmen, who are very, very slow. So it works for them. 10 out of 10. Sabertooth animals are awesome. And now, once again, we have the good time ruiners. These are descendants of the humans that left 5 million years ago. The book named one of them, so he is now my scapegoat for all the terrible things that they will bring upon the world. Curse you, Jemez Smoot. They came in, and they started terraforming everything about Earth, including all the animals. 1 out of 10, I was appreciating the megafauna, and they came in and did this. They biologically breeded out tools. These are the air changers. They are used to manipulate the atmosphere and change out the mixture of gases that are in the world because apparently whatever nitrogen-oxygen ratio that the builders appreciate is not what Earth had. They are unrated. They are a computer brain in a biological vessel. These are an engineered food source. They have gone unnamed. And this is what they did to the megafauna. They just cranked up their size, gave them nutritious chemical cocktails, and gently harvest them continuously all the time. One out of ten, they make me sad. These are the mounts. They have a mind controlled by the machine on the head that the little alien dude is holding on to. They were used as tools to move around by the builders, I mean, they literally could have just built a car, as opposed to genetically engineering all of these things. I feel like building a car would have been easier. And these are the general workers. The box head that they have on them gives them air and allows for the builders to mind control them into just building whatever they need. Some of them are very large and powerful so that they can put together a lot of the on mass structures, and some of them are even smaller than the parasites and are used for finer motor control and other such building projects. Once again, they are unrated because they are more biologic machines than a new species itself. But eventually, the builders do leave after about three to five hundred years of taking whatever they want from the Earth and changing the atmosphere to suit their needs. They've left once they had come, they had everything that they had come for. And life on the surface has been utterly damaged. And I just now realized that surface 
is spelled service here. So I'm going to have to live with that forever on the internet. And deep in the ocean, in a time long forgotten, a creature dares to leave its benthic roots and explore more towards the surface. That's right, the aquatics who have done nothing for the entire book, they were holding out on us. They had a population that went deeper to avoid all the overpopulation, and now they are coming back five million years later. Good on the aquatics, everybody. Give them a round of applause. And with that, that is the end of Man After Man. I hope you guys all enjoyed this video. To everybody that recommended this to me, what did I ever do to you? Thank you all for watching. I hope you guys like, comment, subscribe, and have enjoyed the video. As always, have a good night.